Hey everybody, Chili here. Welcome back to Beginner C++ Tutorial 4. And today we've got a big video ahead of us. So you gotta put your game face on, no more memes. Uh, we're gonna be talking about animation and the main game loop. We're gonna be talking about something called scope, and we're gonna be talking about classes, objects, and member variables. You know, no big deal, just, you know, fundamental concepts that underlie most of the major software development today. And I'm not gonna be going into super detail on all these topics right now. That'll come later. Today, just the tip. Just enough to allow us to achieve our goal for this video. But before we get started, three things. First of all, the homework solution for tutorial 3 is in a separate video. Uh, you can find the link to that on the wiki page for tutorial 3. So from now on, homework solutions are all going to be in a separate video. Now the second thing is, this video is actually a remake of the original tutorial video that I recorded back in August 2016. Uh, looking at the statistics for that video, I saw that a lot of people were dropping out of the series at that point. And you know, reconsidering, I feel like the, the content matter of this video is quite important and it's, it's quite complex, so I'm going to be spending more time in this video than I did in the previous one. It's going to be a little more detailed than the videos that you've seen up until this point. But still, if you're having trouble, make sure, you know, you watch the video a couple times and, you know, feel free to drop by the Discord or the forum and, you know, you can get help there. So don't just give up right away. Uh, www.planetchili.net, we in there. For the third thing, I'm going to cut back to past Chili and he's going to tell you some shit about the keyboard. Now there's one thing I kind of forgot to mention in the last video and I just want to briefly talk about it. Different keyboards have different limits on the combinations of keys that you can press. And this is called keyboard ghosting. So if you press certain combinations of keys, some of them will not register. And it depends on keyboard and how it's wired inside. Uh, but the control, shift, and alt modifier keys can work in any combination together with any other, I believe, two keys. Alright, so it's time for the main event. Uh, so what exactly is the goal for this video anyways? Well, in the previous video, Tutorial 3's homework, we made the reticle so that we can move it to any one of these nine positions. And that's great and all, but in a game, that's generally, that's not generally how you're gonna move your shit. Generally in a game, you got a character or something, and it moves around the screen and it maintains its position so when you push a button it will move in that direction and when you release the button it will stay at its current position it won't snap back to the middle of the screen and that's how shit gets done so how do we go from what we had in tutorial 3 to what Chili's got up on the screen right now that's the question so let's try and figure out what's actually going on here. Uh, we're going to make an assumption. We're going to assume that this code is going to execute once from top to bottom here. You know, like you would in your standard console application, Henlo world. Um, it's going to run from top here down to the bottom. So you enter here, you create your X and your Y variables, you set them to 400 and 300, and then you uh, add or subtract 100 based on what which of these keys are being pressed. So if the right key is being pressed, move X to the right by 100. If the left is being pressed, move it to the left by 100. Same thing for Y. And then you draw your shit at that position. So that makes sense. So let's say you run through this, and let's say the right key was being pressed. So it's gonna draw the cursor here. And there you go, you've drawn your cursor. But if that's the case, then why does it go back? I mean, once it's run through, it's done, it's drawn the cursor, it should just be there and that's the end of it. But it's not. If we release the key, it goes back to the center. If we press a different direction, it goes into that direction. So clearly, it's not just running through this once, top to bottom, and then drawing the cursor. Something else must be happening. What could it be? Now, to understand what's going on here, we got to talk about something called the game loop and animation in general. Now, in a normal program, in a console application that they usually have you do in a beginner course, you know, the first one you're going to write is going to look something like this, right? Hello world, right? Hello world. And uh, you got your program here. You 
you, it starts execution, it runs to the bottom, and then it's done. That's what you're, you're probably used to if you've tried learning programming uh, before coming here. Here's another example of a standard beginner program, right? You, uh, you enter the program here, it outputs a message, you input some number, then it does some calculation and it's over. Now, the, the program runs here, it pauses here, and it waits until you input a number, and then it continues execution. Now, this is important, because in a game, you can't just pause execution somewhere. That's no good. Why is it no good? Well, think about the way animation works, okay? As you probably already know, an animation is just a sequence of still frames shown one after another in rapid succession, and that tricks your brain into thinking that there is some object, you know, moving on the screen. So in a game, the computer is drawing those still frames on the go. So it draws one object at a time. It composes a frame of the scene, and then it shows that frame to the user, and then it starts drawing the next frame. As the objects move in the simulated game world, their position at which they're drawn on the screen changes a little bit every frame. And that gives the illusion of actual motion. Now, the problem with code like this in a game is that you can't pause the whole system and wait for something to happen because if you do that all animation freezes and you just get a frozen game so getting input from the user or some kind of interaction or some kind of wait or pausing it doesn't work the same way that it works in a yeah, simple console application like this this is called blocking by the way you can't block execution it's always got to be going on and it's always got to be repeating basically the same process the process of building a frame and then showing it to the user shown in a simple diagram that looks something like this you know you process your input you update your game and then you render that to the screen and then you go back and you do it all over again roughly you know 60 times a second and you might say, well, Chili, okay, I mean, I see here we're processing input, here we're updating variables that have to do with our quote-unquote game, uh, here we're rendering, but where is the loop? Where, how does it repeat? Well, let me, we're going we're gonna to take a little in-depth look under the hood of the framework. Nothing super detailed at this point, but just a quick peek to get an idea of what we're dealing with. And to do that, we're going to use something called the debugger. Uh, the debugger is a super useful tool in programming, and I'm going to be talking a lot more about it in tutorial 7, so you have to wait for that. So right now, don't worry about the details of what I'm doing. Don't get all fucked up if you don't understand everything, you're not 100% sure of what I'm doing here. Just realize that it will become clear in a later tutorial. Right now, I'm just giving you a quick tour. So to use the debugger, what we do is we uh, we click, we basically set a breakpoint. That's a point that the uh, the program is going to stop at, and we got to put the program into debug mode, uh, and then we run with the debugger, and this will run our program, and it'll stop when it hits the breakpoint. Again, I'm going to be going over this in detail later on. Now we can see the values of our variables in this window here. So we as we step and the stepping buttons are here, step over, we can see what's happening to these variables. It's not super important for us right now, but we can see the steps of how shit's popping off. And then it's gonna jump in here, it's gonna draw all those pixels. Now what we're interested in is what happens at the end. Now here's where it gets interesting. We're gonna step out of this function, because we finished this function. And again, I'll talk about functions more later on. Don't worry about it, we'll get to it. We step out of this, and now we're in a different function called game.go. So game.go calls these functions. It calls begin frame, update model, compose frame, and then end frame. So update model is basically that corresponds to that thing I was showing you before here. Uh, update game, and also process input. And then compose frame is the rendering portion and then end frame. So okay, that's fine. We begin a frame, we start drawing a frame, we update the model, we actually draw the frame, then we end frame. This is where the frame gets actually uh, presented to the user. But 
where is the repetition? We just what happens when we end this function? Well, let's step out of this function now. And now we are in win main. This is the top level function of our program. And as there's a lots of shit in here that doesn't make any sense. Forget about this catch and try bullshit. What's important is this thing here. This is called a uh, while loop, and this will repeat the code that is in here until some condition. So what our program is doing, essentially, is it, uh, let, me let me get rid of this breakpoint here. And again, I'll step through here. And I'm gonna step out, step out. And now, we're just gonna keep looping, and we continually call the game dot go function. So this is where one frame of the game is being processed. And this loop is doing this approximately 60 times a second. It depends on your monitor. Uh, my monitor has 60 hertz refresh rate, so it's going to process this loop 60 frames, 60 times a second. So this is why... Uh, where's my game? This, this, by the way, this is in, uh, where is this? Main.cpp. That's where we're right now. Uh, but if we go back to game.cpp, uh, we can see this is why, uh, our reticle can move. Because in one frame, when it goes through here, it checks to see what buttons are being pressed. And then it draws the reticle at that point. So when we press right, now it's drawing the reticle here 60 times a second. It's super fast. You can't tell because it's nothing's changing. But it is redrawing it 60 times a second. And when we release that button, it draws it again, but now the position has changed, so it draws it over here. It's not technically moving the reticle here. It's always drawing the reticle. And the position at which it draws it depends on what buttons are being pressed. The buttons being pressed determine how the X and the Y are being changed, and that determines how it gets drawn in that particular frame. So that's one part of the puzzle. Now we understand how the reticle is moving on the screen with this code. So all we need to be able to do is we want to be able to keep track of the current position of the reticle on the screen. And uh, when, for example, when we're pressing the right button, we want to move that position by a little bit every frame. So I've got my reticle here right now. Let's say its position is about 50-50. And uh, now if I push a button, it's going to start adding some value to that every frame and it's going to be moving. And when I release the button, it's now going to be at, I don't know what this is, like 450 or something. And that's, that's what we want. That's how we want to live our life. Unfortunately, uh, we cannot have nice things. Now, to understand why we cannot have nice things, I got to talk to you about another thing called scope. Uh, this is the other piece of the puzzle. It's not what I gargle with before I kiss your mother. Uh, that's not it. it. Basically, what scope is, is it is the uh, the lifespan of a variable. So variables, they have a set lifespan. Uh, now, we know when they are born because they are born when we declare them. For example, if I try to go, you know, x equals x plus, fuck, plus one here, the compiler is going to say, what the fuck is this? I don't know. It, there's, there is no such thing as an x because x isn't alive yet. x becomes, comes into existence when you type this line here, int x. Uh, so we know where an x or where a variable's life starts, where does it end? That is the question. And the answer is, well, this variable x, variable y, it will cease to exist, it will be destroyed at the end of this function. When you reach the end of the function in which the variable was defined, it will be destroyed. Uh, and that there defines its scope. So the scope of x is from here down to here. The scope of y is from here down to here. The scope of, uh, what's the other one? There it is. gb is from here down to here. They all die at the end of the function. And that's a problem because what we want to be able to do, remember, is we want to be able to have a uh, reticle and remember its position from frame to frame. 
So if it moves a little bit in a frame, it's got to remember that for the next frame. But if we store that information in a variable, like x or y here, that information is going to be lost when the variable dies at the end of this function. So we need a way of being able to keep that information from one frame to the next. Now, since we're on the topic of scope, there's two more things that I want to go over because it's just it's convenient right now to do so. Uh, the first thing is that you can have scopes inside of scopes inside of scopes. It's uh, it's scopeception. So, for example, in this if statement in the control block here, I can declare a new variable and go int pubes, and that will create an integer here. How long will that integer live? Well, let's try something. Let's put uh, pubes is equal to 69 down here. What's going to happen? The compiler ain't going to like it. Unidentified identifier. And that is because pubes is dead at the end of this curly brace. So the scope of pubes is inside of these curly braces, just like the scope of X and Y is inside of these curly braces. And you can see a pattern whenever you see curly braces, you think, oh, that's a new scope. So you can define variables inside of curly braces that are inside of curly braces, but it's only going to live until the end of that matching brace, and then it's going to be destroyed. Now, the second thing, and this is kind of important, uh, I've mentioned this before, but you can't have two variables of the same name. If I try to go int y here, the compiler is going to be like, you can't do that. Well, it should be like, you can't do that. But apparently, IntelliSense doesn't think so. Here we go. Int y redefinition. So it's no good. But what if I do int y inside of here? Now let's try and build this. We get no problem. So what's, what gives? Well, you can't have two variables of the same name at the same scope level. So I can't have int y here. But you can have two different variables with the same name if they have different scope levels. Uh, and that's important for a number of reasons. So what happens then? If you have two y's now, how do you know which one gets changed when you do, for example, y is equal to y plus you know 10,000? Obviously, this is going to put our cursor in a bad place on the screen. If we run this, we see that our cursor is fine no harm, no foul. So what, what gives? Well, this y is different than this y. And when we declare this y in this scope here, basically it is now covering up this y. This y cannot be seen because this one, it's being obscured by the closer y. And when we leave this scope, now if I do y is equal to y plus, you know, I don't know, 234 this will have an effect on the cursor. It's going to be down here now. And the reason why is because this y is now destroyed. So now when we type y, we mean this one. So just two little tidbits of information there. Number one, you can have scopes within scopes. And number two, you can redefine a variable if it is inside of a nested scope. And then that variable is going to cover up variables in of the same name in an outer scope. So now we see our problem. We have to prevent our position information from being lost from frame to frame. We want to keep that information alive across frames. Now to understand how we're going to accomplish that, we need to learn about classes and we need to learn about objects. But that's going to have to wait until the next video. I'm actually going to split up tutorial 4 into three parts. So you can click on over to tutorial 4.2 where I'm going to teach you about classes, objects, and member variables, and we're going to implement the free moving reticle. In the meanwhile, if you enjoyed this video, please click the like button and leave a comment. It helps out a great deal. And I will see you soon with some more C++. Mm -hmm.